the presentation of anarchism, anarchism a social philosophy which aims at the emancipation, economic, social, political, and spiritual of the human race. The emancipation. Anarchist Essays is brought to you by Loughborough University's Anarchism Research Group. For more information on the ARG, see the link in the show notes or follow us on Twitter at ARGLBORO. Publishing is Posh by Craig Clark. This is a quote from Jason Williamson of Sleep and Mods from Don't Magazine, Issue 6. The thing I hate most about expressing myself on this issue are the terrible hurdles, the justification, the points to back it up. It's hard to explain a lot of the time, and you find yourself retreating even if you feel you have a point. A simple, look, it's shit, just won't do in the eyes of the dominators. The gatekeepers want intelligent answers, borrowed chasms of justification that are wholly unrealistic, really. You are just simply not climbing the fucking wall, are you? The expose never gets written. A question I've been asking myself recently is, can radical publishing even exist? Isn't radical publishing actually a widely overlooked oxymoron? Are the ideas represented by the words radical and publishing actually so disparate that you can't really put them together without some serious cognitive dissonance, the holding of two contradictory values at the same time. I have no real experience of the publishing industry, other than that which I've garnered over several years of involvement in various attempts to spread propaganda with varying degrees of success. So you can take these as the rumbling observations of an amateur, rather than an inside scoop, a whistleblown. But every time I learn something new about the publishing industry, well, it's never a pleasant surprise. Publishing is posh. Everybody knows it. If you tell someone down the pub that you work in publishing, it'll probably be a bit awkward. If you tell someone at a nice dinner party that you work in publishing, you'll be much more warmly welcomed. It's also seen as being associated with the arts. So if you're working in publishing, you're probably nicer than, say, a lawyer, much less associated with vampirism. Depending on the dinner party, this might especially be the case for so-called radical publishing. But as far as I can tell, the entire publishing industry is based around the private ownership of ideas. Contractual control of an author's copyright, the exclusive right to profit from their work, coupled with a standard economic exploitation of their own workers, is how publishers make money. From most radical perspectives, this arrangement seems, at best, a bit fucked up. I do understand the argument that claims we must make concessions if we want radicalism to be mainstream. I'm sympathetic to it. I wrestle with it. I too want to popularise these ideas. And I don't doubt the sincerity of those making tactical concessions and the furtherance of radical ideas. But it is a very fine line to tread and dangerous to stray too far from it. Too much concession leads to corruption and nobody is above temptation. In the words of Don Letts, the minute you want what the man is offering, you are fucked like to offer some alternative models in terms of both the communism of ideas and the communism of work. I'll also talk about some of the problems of political education in itself and finish on a possible salvation by way of praxis. The world's greatest genius. If property is theft, then this is also true of intellectual property. And just as the private ownership of material property has devastating effects for those who are excluded from it, so too does the ownership of things you can't so easily put a fence around have real-world consequences. We print this short statement, righteously plagiarised from someone else, where the notice about copyright usually goes in the front of every dope magazine. Intellectual property is a legally fabricated monopoly, confining culture and science and violently depriving the poorest and most marginalised from access to critical resources. The fictions of copyright and patent are despotic attempts to monopolise the mind, outrageous constraints on intelligence and creativity, and a destructive protectionist scheme for the profit of power. Attempting to own ideas also does a disservice to the inherent communism of all thought. When, on his deathbed, Mikhail Bakunin was asked by one of his followers to write his memoirs, he questioned what the point would be. For Bakunin, his ideas were not strictly his, and he responded, 
the mind of the world's greatest genius is entirely the product of the collective intellectual and industrial labour of all past and present generations. It is perhaps this intellectual magnanimity, this radical generosity, which is, after all, only the most realistic assessment that we should strive for. Apart from the impossibility of owning ideas, if you thought that the ideas contained in a book could change the world for the better, wouldn't you want as many people as possible to read that book? Being a part of the world, isn't that also in your interest? Perhaps that's part of why all those ads that claim to sell the secrets of personal success ring so hollow. Why, then, are you yourself not personally successful? Why do you rely on selling the secrets of personal success? At Dog Section Press, we publish under a Creative Commons license. We didn't have to invent it. It is an actually existing communism, as they say. It means that our authors will be credited for their work, and nobody else can profit financially from it, but it is freely available to be reproduced. The ideas are free to spread and multiply without constraint. This is also part of the reason that we put all of our books online at no charge. It's not like we have to pay for paper and ink, is it? Please stop making expensive books if you want to achieve any sort of change at all. To quote Voltaire, 20 volume folios will never make a revolution. It is the little pocket pamphlets that are to be feared. Collective organising. Of course, content is important but so is form. Penguin have published some very fine books on anarchism, but this does not make them a radical publisher. Would exclusively publishing radical content make you a radical publisher or simply a publisher of radical content? If you believe in communism, then it follows you also believe there's absolutely no reason, beyond pessimism of the will, that any organisation that is currently run on a standard capitalist business model cannot be operated along more collective lines. There are some other external barriers between believing in communism and doing communism, but nobody in our office is fetching coffee because they're further down a power structure. We're making rounds of tea out of love and mutual aid. More importantly, while the members of our cooperative do all have their various specialisms, we make decisions that affect everyone collectively. It's a voluntary association and nobody can be coerced economically or otherwise, into doing something they don't want to do. It's also an imperfect work in progress, but because it's free from the constraints of a rigid hierarchy, it can change, and that change can also be directed collectively. I personally have another, perhaps fairly unique, vantage point, because I've been involved in both publishing people's work, as well as having my own work published. Maybe I got a particularly rough deal. It would probably be different if I had more clout but nobody ever suggested I could have any input into my contract. I could take my 10% or leave it. So when we publish with authors, we don't create contracts at all. We come up with a memorandum of understanding, a free agreement following Kropotkin that is arrived at by the consensus of both author and publisher and open to change over time. We also try to give our authors a much fairer share of any profit than the industry standard of 10% at the same time as aiming to keep our publications as affordable as possible. Nothing about us without us. This is a quote from Kim Kelly, Dope Magazine, Issue 4. Hoarding knowledge within a small, rarefied circle may allow said group to gain a deeper understanding of its own principles and mission. But then, what's the use? How are you going to get enough people on board with said mission if they're coming into it blind, sans context? You can't foment revolution if 9 out of 10 people don't know what the fuck you're on about. Not so long ago, I saw a post on social media from someone in a marginalised group talking about their marginalisation that claimed, it's not my job to educate people. The discussion it prompted was heated and opinion was polarised, almost split down the middle. There's an implication that the job of educating the ignorant involves unpaid labour, which might be particularly galling when their ignorance is part of the oppression. Equally, it could be seen as a vital part of countering that oppression. If we remove the economic exploitation element from the equation, the question could be restated as, is it my role to educate people? Someone else on social media had actually created a Venn diagram of respondents to this question. In one circle was oppressed people, and in the other circle was activists. 
The oppressed circle answered a resounding no, while the activist circle answered an equally emphatic yes. In the middle of these two circles were the confused and much smaller group that answered with increasing exasperation, yes, no, maybe, I don't know, leave me alone. Perhaps part of the confusion would be alleviated if this middle group was significantly larger. Of course, no one would want to achieve this by increasing oppression, which leaves us with political education. This might be the space for David Graeber's oft-quoted equation of change, which, according to him, only ever happens when there is a confluence of interests and action between the least oppressed and the most marginalised. Bringing about this coalition of revolutionary solidarity is obviously fraught with tension. Regardless of who's doing it, so-called consciousness raising can be seen as patronising and therefore counterproductive. But inaction inevitably leads to further entrenched oppression. We have very recently published a book entitled Abolishing the Police, and the editor, Kosh Goodough, has done a much better job of bringing out some of these tensions in her introduction than I can. So I'm just going to read her words to you here. Making a book both rigorous and accessible is not easy. And I want to say a bit more here about how we have thought about and approached this challenge. This collection is written by people who have experienced and borne witness to state violence, have been part of struggles against it, and write out of commitment to those struggles. This commitment brings with it a political responsibility to write in a way that is not academic in an exclusionary sense. Many people with crucial insights into the realities of the current system and how to resist it, knowledge gained at the sharp edge of policing, do not have the privilege of academic training. An analysis of the injustices of policing that was inaccessible to them would be self-defeating. On the other hand, denying ourselves the use of any vocabulary that might be unfamiliar to readers would mean discarding many powerful tools for understanding and fighting oppression. Concepts like ideology like racial capitalism, disciplinary power and intersectionality. These are weapons honed over decades and even centuries of rebellious theory making, devised and tested and contested in the context of real political struggles. To throw them away limits the thoughts we can express. It limits our ability to say true things about the police and what is wrong with them and what we can and should do about it. It is also patronising as well as simply inaccurate to assume an inability or unwillingness to engage in complex thinking on the part of those outside of academic institutions. That says it all for me, but at the same time, we never lose sight of the fact that the first time you see a cop beating an unarmed protester with a truncheon, for no immediately discernible reason, will always be more radicalising, will say more about the nature of the state than all of the words written in every book can ever hope to. Theory and action. Theory both informs action and is, in turn, informed by action. This is the crux of the revolutionary concept of praxis. While we were in the final stages of putting together Make Rojava Green Again, a book we published in solidarity with the International Commune of Rojava, as in all the profit went to them, Turkey invaded a friend and made the beautiful map of Rojava a designer had created instantly obsolete. We published it anyway, because we hope that one day that territory will be reclaimed. But I use this as an example of the incompatibility of publishing that hopes to shape events with the unpleasant surprise that is publishing cycles, which are mostly based around marketing imperatives. Nobody will even review a book unless they know about it at least six months in advance, but your enemy is simply not hanging about like that. I'd like to reclaim the term propaganda. It's certainly preferable to publishing in its current form. It's all too often associated with various forms of totalitarian control and capitalist coercion, but it can also be used to persuade people to take a particular course of action. Following Lucy Parsons, this course of action could actually be a step towards freedom. As she said, anarchists know that a long period of education must precede any great fundamental change in society. Hence they do not believe in vote begging, nor political campaigns, but rather in the development of self-thinking individuals. For Erico Malatesta, as long as the propagandist sticks to certain anarchist principles, show, don't tell, stand with, not for, expose, don't conceal, then the job of propaganda was, in his words, 
pushing the people to demand and to seize all the freedom they can, and to make themselves responsible for providing their own needs, without waiting for orders from any kind of authority. In the end, the revolution might just consist of people actually doing the things they talk about doing. If you spend your entire working life publishing radical ideas, then you're probably better placed than most to begin that doing. If you want things to be different, you have to do things differently. To paraphrase Ursula Le Guin, you cannot publish the revolution. You can only be the revolution. It is in your spirit or it is nowhere. Thank you for listening. To help others find Anarchist Essays, please rate and review us wherever you find your podcasts. And if you're interested in anarchist ideas, why not check out the journal Anarchist Studies? For over 20 years, Anarchist Studies has been publishing original research on the history, theory, and practice of anarchism. For more information, visit www.lwbooks.co.uk forward slash anarchist studies.